Welcome to the Hands On Business Podcast, where else are you going to come to get tips, tricks, and advice on growing your business? As you know, what people tend to love about this podcast is that it is a place where you can hear real business leaders discussing systems, methodologies, and strategies that they have used to help them catapult growth in their business. So I'm your podcast host, Hakeem Adebiyi, and I've grown several small businesses to multi-million pound enterprises and noticed that there wasn't really a place that focused on where I was, i.e. growing a small business. All of the content that seemed to be out there was about big business and often just a lot of theory and no practical implementable advice, which is exactly why I set up this podcast. Today, we're going to be talking to Claire Walton, who was a HR professional with some of the big PLCs, such as W.H. Smith, Dixon's, Carlsberg, to name but a few. Claire then transitioned to leadership performance coaching. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about the common practices of successful leaders and coaches. We're going to find out all about Claire's interesting journey from corporate HR to running her own business and pick up lots of tips about what you need to do to be a successful leader and or coach. We'll explore Claire's thoughts on the principles to become a successful leader and look at practical examples. So, happy listening. Delighted to have Claire Walton on the show today. Claire is a leadership performance coach, facilitator and speaker. Now, she's transitioned from a career in HR, and we are just talking about that off camera actually, uh, and has worked across a number of sectors with high profile PLCs and SMEs. Now, Claire started her coaching business, Leaders Are Mad, in 2014, so I'm very interested in why, why it's called that. <laughs> and recently, uh, Claire also published a book, which became an Amazon bestseller called Super Neuro, Super Neuro You. Um, uh, and then on today's episode, what we're going to be talking about with Claire is the common practices of successful leaders and coaches. So welcome, Claire. Thanks very much, Hakeem. Really looking forward to this conversation. We've had it booked in for a while and I am really excited to get going. <laughs> Same here. So let's kick off with, uh, you know, a transition. You know, HR or most of the HR people I've worked with tend to stay in HR till the die, really. So just talk to me about your career, you know, how you started and, and how you come to where you are now. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you should say that because that was definitely one of the things that I did not want to happen right throughout my career is ever die anywhere. <laughs> I, want to yes. say that, I don't mean literally, but you know, like kind of like get to that point where you're really just bored and you and you feel dead inside. So, I mean, I actually started my H, HR career um, so long ago, Hakeem, they didn't even call it HR, right? <laughs> there was no such thing as, as chief people officer, or any of these wacky titles as well that have come out recently, it was personnel, you know, because oh, yes. I, I am going back to when you were maybe just a sparkle in your mother's eye. <laughs> <laughs> I am going back to the late 80s I started. Um, and I did some senior management roles in retail, in the school of hard knocks her game, right? Supermarket retail. You know, it doesn't get much tougher than supermarket retail. Um, but absolutely brilliant way to start. And, uh, but to your point, I then in my uh, mid through to late twenties came out of HR roles. I think that we transitioned to calling them HR by then. Uh, out of HR roles and into um, general management roles. So I ran a few stores for the supermarket retailer, which was Asda at the time. This is before, before the Walmart takeover. And, um, and Asda was a really exciting organization to work in because it was going through massive change um, on every single level. And it was, it was just sweeping the board on the performance stakes versus um, its competition back then. And it's a different story now, to be fair, but back then it absolutely was. And so I developed my real interest in leadership outside of doing the HR role. It was when I was you know, leading teams of up to 400 people in a store to create the bottom line we were talking about off camera. You know, it was, um, I mean, I'm going, when, when am I going back now? So it was uh, 1995, six, seven, um, when I was doing those roles. And 
you know, you're in a store and back there, my store, the last store I was in, I think it took about a million pounds um, revenue a week. So, I mean, God knows what it would be these days, um, particularly with the cost of living these days. <laughs> but I mean, you're talking big money week in, week out. And I was in my mid through to late 20s doing those sorts of roles. You've got 400 people. You've got 30 odd thousand customers coming through your store each week. And you are responsible for making sure that everything from a general management perspective um, is as it needs to be in order to create that bottom line. And I took my stores, um, fundamentally, I did two stores where I turned them around from bottom quartile performers to top quartile performers in, um, in a year. Now, I'm telling you that even though it's way back when, um, when tills were tills and they rang. <laughs> no, we, we had actually just about got EPOS in uh, electronic point of sale back then, but only just. Um, because I then went back into a, um, to HR roles and then went through a HR career of some note with some pretty huge organisations um, and was HR director and did some executive HR director roles and so on. Uh, but do you know what that, that um, frustration actually of not being so close to the action sometimes was, um, was always sort of there. Um, and we, again, we were talking off camera about um, from a HR perspective, you know, working with the rest of your colleagues to deliver that bottom line result. Whether you're working for a, a profit organization actually or a not-for-profit, there's still a bottom line outcome, isn't there? But there's bot so it's not necessarily always monetary, but it's bottom line outcomes. Um, and I think that that served me really well as a as a HR person because I wasn't a HR person in the sense of I was about the business. Yeah, I wanted to be a leader of the business. When I was an, an executive director as well, I was an executive director first. I happened to do HR, um, and I think that you know that was recognised. You know, when I went into the businesses and. It helped me be able to make things happen pretty quickly, which was helpful because there's quite a lot of interim roles. Um, and then I left all of that uh, a wee while ago. Um, I've had two stints of coming out and doing something similar to what I do now, but under my own brand, Leaders Are Mad, um, coaching executive directors, leaders, and small business owners for eight years now. Okay, so and just just to go back to your, your supermarket there, because you've obviously now worked with lots of different businesses. Why do you say that it's the school of hard knocks and it's so difficult? What what what's the most different thing that you're saying about, say, a supermarket or something else that you know from a retail, but not from a retail point of view, but just from a business point of view, what's the biggest challenge? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things you know back then it, it is that um, the volume of customers that you have, supermarket retailing. You know, people are coming to your store three, four, you know, some people every day, you know, but th otherwise three, four times a week, maybe. And you have to be able to um, maintain their loyalty week in, week out with them coming to visit you several times a week. And there is direct competition next door sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not even a mile away. It could yeah. even be pretty much next door so you know it's fast paced it's highly competitive um it's ultimately we're all selling the same product as well you know even the own brand stuff often is coming from the same manufacturer yeah. you know so your point of difference is your people and your culture and your service um, and when I say service, I mean that in a really broad sense. So it's not just the behavioral aspect of service. You know, it's it's um, people even behind the scenes in a supermarket doing their jobs well so that you've got the stock on the shelf. You know, you find some mum coming in um, or some dad, to be fair, you know, coming in five o'clock in the afternoon after the kids up from school and they're trying to get tea together. And the very thing that they plan to make is not available. You know, the ingredients are not there. They are not available. You know, I mean, I've been there because I've been that store manager as well. 
yeah, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned before about having kids. It's like, you know, they're very demanding, aren't they? You know, and they like what they, a lot of them, they like what they like and they don't like what they don't like. And, you know, it's just this, it, it's, it's quite a high pressured environment in that sort of sense. Margins are really tight. Whoa. Um, You know, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of your stock that's, that's loss leaders as well. You know, you've got a lot of uh, money tied up in stock. So you've got to get your stock levels right. So it's that, that tension. And you get this in loads of different types of organizations. But that tension that I learned back then between, um, you know, having, for example, the availability of the stock so that you're not disappointing the customer, but at the same time, not having too much of the stock. So you're not tying up all your money in that stock, as well as potentially creating waste and so on. Just the intricacies of running a, um, that sort of business um, teach you commerciality um, at the sharp end. They teach you customer service at the sharp end. They teach you what it's like to operate within a community as well mm-hmm. at the sharp end. And more than anything, they teach you about the nature of the human being. Ah, uh, yes, in, in B. So we'll, we'll come into that in a minute. So, so just in in terms of because obviously you you said that you took you know two two stores actually within a year from bottom per, uh, quartile to top quartile, and obviously it's it's a competitive environment. You've got lots of store managers. You've got lots of stores. So, what was it that you did differently than those other store managers to actually do, accelerate that uh, over a, such a short period of time? Yeah. So, this is a long time ago. Remember. <laughs> However, it's it absolutely sticks with me, and and it does completely relate to this similarity between leadership and coaching. So, first store that I got, um, for me, it was key to go in there and build relationships with my team. That's the first and foremost thing. Yeah, leadership. Um, including leading a team of people running a supermarket to create a very commercial bottom line is about relationships. It's about being able to know who you can trust, develop trust with people and get people to trust you. So when I'm talking about relationships, if I was going to pick one thing about relationships, I'd talk about trust. And it's that reciprocal trust as well. It's not just about who can I trust as the as the leader of that store, it's, it's, you know, how do I get their trust in me and how do I get them their trust in my vision of success for this store? Um, so again, that could be your operation, your business, whatever it might be. Um, now, vision of success, also absolutely key. You know, I walked in there and my intent was within a year to get into top quartile or everything, you know. Um, and I, I, the way, did you ever when you were a kid or do your kids now do painting by numbers? Uh, well, I did. I don't think I'm like, my kids did for a very, very long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the way I kind of like think um, as a leader in terms of the vision of success, it's like, it's a bit like painting by numbers. I provide this sort of outline, you know, kind of like the, the key components of my vision. Right? But then I've got to work with the team to create, to put the colour in it, yeah. Without without the team, there's no colour to it. Does that sort of make sense as a metaphor? Oh, it's perfect. It's an absolute perfect sense. Yeah. So it, it's getting that team of people to, you know, come together with each other and me um, for us to be able to get all the right colours to fill in the detail in terms of that, what, what's the vision of success? So kind of understanding where are we now and vision of success. When we're understanding the where are we, are we now, I absolutely love all the, um, you know, the Jim Collins books, Good to Great. Oh, yes, Built Good to, to Great, Built to Last. Oh, yeah, yeah my yeah, favourites. Lo- yeah, love all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, this idea um, about assessing and being honest about the brutal facts, you know, we are bottom quartile. It feels shit to be here, yeah. <laughs> and that's the other thing is, you know, it's it's connecting in terms of relationship. It's connecting um, with what's in it for me with other people. It's like people want to work somewhere where they want to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like the vision of success isn't just 
metrics, let's say, around, you know, revenues and margins and so on and availability and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's also what sort of place do we collectively want to work? So how do we create this successful in terms of the measures of the organization, but successful for us in terms of the sort of place we want to be working? And it's those two things. And we created that vision of success led by me, you know, I'd the outline if you like. Um, and then assessing the brutal facts of where we are now <laughs> and then working out together, how are we going to get there? What does that roadmap look like? How do we utilize people in, you know, the, the most appropriate way? And when I say most appropriate way, again, key thing, um, strengths-based leadership. So identifying people's strengths, you know, and allowing them to apply more of their strengths and less of their weaknesses. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's a thing out these days, um, a friend of mine actually, a guy called um, Rob Baker, a bit of a shout out to him. He's, he wrote a book on and he, he does a lot of work around something called job crafting. That's kind of what we were doing back then without knowing it was job crafting. You know, we were <laughs> we were making sure that as I was building the relationships with them and they were with me, you know, making sure that we allowed people to work to their strengths, you know, change their hours so their hours worked for them. You know, again, we talk a lot about flexible work in these days, but we were doing it back then. The jobs, the environment had to work for people for them to want to work and be able to work their best for us so that we could do everything we needed to do on that roadmap to achieve that vision of success. And so much more, values-based leadership, big part of it. Um, but if you if you were to ask me, and I thought about this the other day, you know, okay, if you were to ask me, where did I get that model of leadership from? I don't honestly know. I don't <laughs> know back then. Now I've validated it since through all of my studies, my reading, and and all the rest of it. And so I can now point to, um, you know, the likes of the books built to last and good to great, and all the. Harvard Business, you know, review articles that I have devoured over the years. Um, but all of that came after that, to be fair. Um, but it kind of validated I was I was doing the right thing. So I don't know. Was it nature? Was it nature or was it nurture that well, it, it, were it your questions? I know you're gonna ask me. <laughs> it's obviously certainly nature at that particular point, but the the, the, the question I always ask people, because obviously that what you've done is you you've got a methodology and you've out you've you've validated it later uh, and lots of successful people uh, who are successful in their own right don't necessarily validate it uh, and therefore they struggle to then reproduce it and even if they can reproduce it they can't help other people reproduce it because they haven't got a methodology uh, because I was just I was writing down what you were saying and actually when you look at them um, a lot of them when you know about it it's, it's just common sense isn't it you know to build trust well, you do that in any relationship. So why wouldn't you do it if you try to lead a group of people, you know, to actually have a vision? Then, yeah, people need to know where what direction they're going in. They need to buy into it. And then, you know, value-based region, leadership and all that sort of good stuff. You know, it's, it's all it's all, it's all all what they... T it's all very derogueur now, but back then it was probably quite revolutionary, actually. Uh, yeah. you know, people were aware of it. Well, it, but it's interesting you say that, you know, because one of the things my clients say all the time, and I love it when they say it, actually, they always think they're being offensive when they say it and they're not, right? But whether it be like a group scenario that I'm working with, do some group coaching or individuals, there'll be a point in time where they'll go, it's obvious really, isn't it? <laughs> About some aspect of what I'm going through with them. And I'll say, well, was it obvious when you walked in the room? <laughs> because it always feels obvious afterwards when it's pointed out to you. But here's the thing, a lot of people in leadership roles I do not think are necessarily, well, I, I, I can evidence this through the people that I work with, you know, that come to me. It's not what they are intentionally applying. A lot will go in and get um, absorbed into the day-to-day -day operations, the detail of that day to day, usually at least two levels down, <laughs> whilst responding to what their boss boss um, says is important, whether it is or it isn't important, 
Um, so they're doing the politicking up here, if you like. Yeah. They're in the day-to-day down there, usually one or two levels down. And generally speaking, reacting, 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 um, as opposed to leading. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a very good uh, <laughs> assessment of most leadership teams that I've seen, actually. And, it, and it's, you know, people say it's obvious, people say it's common sense, but unfortunately, common sense doesn't seem to be that common. I think it needs to be called something else, actually. Uh, yeah. Because w- whenever I speak to leaders, especially in the bigger companies, they'll just, in fact, I used to have a boss who, who whenever he saw what I'm about to describe, would say, would say oh, that's just pure, pure business bollocks. Uh, and and there's loads of it that flies around, and it's like, well, no, just tell me what is it you're trying to achieve, and actually they either can't articulate it or they don't want to articulate it because they think wrapping it up with lots of um, MBA stuff around it and terminology makes them sound really intelligent. And you're like, yeah, it might say it make you sound intelligent, but do the people you're leading understand what you're doing, and are they actually yeah. going to follow you because you're not speaking their language? Uh, and actually, you just talking about value value based leadership, you know. Are you being authentic? Are you doing what you really believe in? Or are you, are you just saying the things either that you believe should be said or your boss has told you to do something, so you're just doing it, as opposed to saying, actually, no, I've sat around and I've actually thought about this and this is where I feel the business should be going. And as a team, this is, you know, as you said, I, I really like that painting by the numbers. How do we put the colour around getting to that particular uh, place in this particular time? Uh, and I recognise, I, I really recognise that. It's a, it's a nice way of just putting it together. So, so on that, because obviously when we were talking about the podcast and we were sort of like saying, well, what's the title? Um, and you said, do you want it to do you know, the principles and the, uh, and the, the steps in leadership and coaching? So I was really interested because uh, every time I speak to people, they either they separate the two things out and either they want to talk about coaching or they want to talk about leadership. So, so tell me, why, why was it that you said, yeah, I want to do leadership and coaching? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, so when I, and again, this is an inch, when I, it's only when I look back on my coaching career now that I realized that there are so many similarities. And that's why I wanted to kind of point this out. So when I'm working with a client, let's just say I'm working with an individual for a moment, because I work with individuals, groups, and teams. Um, But when I'm working with an individual client, the process we are working through or the framework that we're working through is, um, first of all, we're trying to establish what is the outcome or outcomes that you want from the coaching? Yeah. What is it you want from the coaching? Where are you now? (laughs) Again, being really honest, where are you now? Now, to get them to be really honest about where they are now. Yeah, we have to establish a relationship that's of high trust. (laughs) Again, same sort of thing. You've got to establish that sort of relationship because the way they are now, um, that's 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 taking them to be a very vulnerable place. If I talk about a supermarket, I can talk about the the you know the kind of like the brutal facts in terms of performance of the supermarket. When we're with it, when I'm with an individual, it's the brutal facts of where are they now? You know, yeah. <laughs> how are they showing up? What are they doing? What are they not doing? What are their attitudes? What are their beliefs? What's their identity? Um, you know, all of that sort of um, stuff, and at and at a very deep level. And and for some people, um, you've really got to shine the spotlight on that for them to have the level of self-awareness that they need for us to be able to at least have a platform, a foundation that is sensible for them from then for us to like work forward from in order to achieve the outcomes that they want them to achieve. So there's some similar mechanics, if you like, going on there, similar framework going on there. And this this idea of this relationship of of high trust. Um, you know, I have to trust them and they have to trust me. Now, you might think, well, from a coaching perspective, um, you know, why do I need to trust them? Well, I'll tell you, because I, want, I don't want to work with anybody that's not actually going to take it seriously, <laughs> yeah. make use of all the insights that I help them create in the session <laughs> um, and the homework that I very carefully craft for them 
I want to make sure that they're going to take it seriously. They're going to do, I mean, by the way, we have fun. We have a laugh. So I don't want them to like take it seriously, seriously. But, uh, you know, I want them to go and take action because if they don't take any action, if they don't do something differently, nothing's going to change. And quite frankly, I don't want to work with people when nothing's going to change. It doesn't do my reputation any good. <laughs> They're unlikely to refer me to anybody else. Um, and yeah, I just don't have a very good feeling, you know. It's not very fulfilling. So there's a couple of those things that are very, very um, similar. The other thing that's really similar is when I'm working with the client, before, you know, we can really look at the, those goals in terms of the outcomes that they want from their coaching. Um, what we also have to do is we have to look at a, a bigger, broader vision of success. Right? So I always do work with my clients. And again, I do this in a group situation. I do this in team situations as well. What does that vision of success look like? So from a development point of view, yeah, what does success look like? Um, now, here's another thing. When, when I'm working with the individuals or the groups, I'm talking about human beings where success will be beyond those extrinsic, obvious kind of rewards, let's say. So a promotion. Yeah, um, uh, you know, moving out of this job into another job, a different career, a different company, um, you know, developing some obvious skills that other people can witness are obvious sort of skills. It's beyond all of that. You know, it's about how they feel about themselves. It's how they feel about work. It's how they feel about their job. It's how they feel about the organisation that they work in um, or own. <laughs> I mean, you know, believe it or not, you know, I've got people who are small business owners um, and it's it's their business. Nobody else's business. It's their business. And yet they still don't really take ownership no. of their business in the, the real sense of, you know, they can have whatever they want and so on. So, you know, I'll work with them on this vision of success. I'll also work with them on their values. So, again, we've got organizational values where leaders are trying to align people to the organizational values. We've got to work on their values in the coaching. You know, what are their values and um, and how do they align their values to the current role they've got in the current organization so that they can be more effective? And if they can't 100% align them and that's not going to be good enough for them, well, what are they going to do about it? So mm -hmm. we'll tend to work on those sorts of um, things. This just time and time again, you know, when I look back on um, what I was uh, affecting, if you like, and how I was doing it as a leader, I'm actually doing the same thing in my coaching um, with the people that I am coaching. It's, it's a lot of the same skills I'm using. So you, you talked about authenticity um, earlier on there. I show up authentic, you know, authentically with my clients. Um, you know, I'm not kind of like sitting there as the... Um, how do I sort of put it? You know, as the the adult in the room, if you like, that's patronizing and condescending, you know, the person that's sort of coming in. I'm there, we're equal, we're two human beings doing the best that we can. <laughs> um, and that that sort of helps establish that trust, mm. yeah, that we, that we sort of talked about in terms of the relationship. Um, and as we're doing that, you know, um, sometimes they're going to come for me to me for well, Claire, you know, when you were an exec director, you know, on the board here or whatever it was, you know, how would you have dealt with a similar situation that I'm finding myself in now? Yeah. And I will do that. I will share things. I will, I will say some, look, I can share with you what worked for me. But it worked for me. Now, whether or not it's going to work for you is another matter. Yeah. Whether or not it's going to work for you is another matter. But I'm more than happy to share what worked for me. But I'm not going to tell you what you should do. No one tell you what you should do because you've got to decide, you know, what you think you should do. Again, I would have done the same thing as a as a um, leader back then. And never forget, there was um, <laughs> there's a girl called Heather Lord. I've told this story a few times, but this girl called Heather Lord um, was in my sort of team um, when I was about 23, 24 years old. And she was a, they called it store personnel manager back then. And, uh, and I was the regional personnel manager back then for Asda. 
And uh, she used to ring me up and no video call or anything else. Like she used to ring me up and tell me a situation and ask me, what should she do? And I wouldn't tell her what she should do, of course. You know, I, was, I would actually be coaching her at the time. Well, what do you think you should do? Well, I don't know. That's why I rang you. <laughs> well, let's just stop for a minute. Have a think about it. What do you think you should do? Well, I don't know. That's why I rang you. Okay. Well, let's assume that I'm not here and I can't answer the phone. Yeah. Have a think about it. What do you think you should do? And eventually, she starts to come up with stuff. Yeah. And I would be at her. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, that sounds good. Yep. Yeah. And then maybe sprinkle on a little bit of something extra. She'd go away and she'd know what she'd do. After a while of this, it eventually got to a point where she stopped calling me and she just got on and she did it. And she had what we'd call competence and confidence. <laughs> yes. And I met her, Hakeem, I met her about 15 years ago. And uh, she said, oh, my God, when you first came in and uh, took over the patch and I used to ring you, I used to be so frustrated with you. I used to think, I don't know why I'm even bothering ringing her, which said, I so get it now. I so, and, you know, she, she, she did really, really well in, in her own career sort of after that. Now, my point of kind of like telling you that story is it's back then I was the leader. I wasn't the coach. Yeah. I didn't have the title coach. But in my leadership role back then, you know, I did a lot of coaching, a lot of helping other people realize that they have most of, if not all of the answers for themselves, if they would just take the time to think about it. And if they had the environment created and the relationship of trust related where someone was there they had their back they were going to give them their support even if they failed you know and they would allow them that first attempt in learning which of course is uh, is is fail first attempt in learning um so that's again when I was a leader I was coaching you know it was a big part of my style would have been to, to be coaching people and now as a coach I'm also leading them as well you know, because I'm putting this leadership process in or framework in of we need to establish this, we need to establish this, we need to create a roadmap and so on and so forth. And, and do you think, because obviously from what you're saying, you believe that actually to be good leaders, um, you know, because you're talking about that vision, establishing that trust and bringing people with you, you have to be a coach. Have you, do, do you think it's a, an, a, a prerequisite for good leadership or have you seen good leaders who aren't good coaches? Okay, so I think it's absolutely a prerequisite to have the coaching capability. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be a qualified coach, but what I'm saying is the fundamentals and skills that we apply in coaching absolutely apply in leadership. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the time, that's not what people are um, it's not what's understood and it's not what's prioritized and it's not what people learn. It's not what's trained. It's not what's talked about enough. So don't get me wrong. If I go back to my role as a leader, there were clearly times when I was directive. Yeah. <laughs> and if anyone listening to this podcast used to work for me, <laughs> they'd be like getting in the comments, you know, on social media and saying, oh my God, hang on a minute. What about the times when you were absolutely telling us, you know, what we had to do and so on? Look, there were times where I was directing the cost, you know, there's a scale, isn't there? You know, there's a range of leadership styles and you apply of, um, those, all of those at different times. What I would say, however, is that more and more so, with what's gone on with Tinternet over the last 30 years, we have people working for us, let's say, and with us when we're in leadership roles who have way more knowledge than people had 30 years ago. That knowledge is at their fingertips. So people back then knew more than they thought they knew. Like Helen, that, um, sorry, Heather, that I spoke about earlier. People now definitely know more. Right? Yeah. People know, but they don't always apply what they know for all sorts of different reasons. Right. So as leaders, our emphasis is not on telling people what they probably already know, what they can learn very quickly, you know, online. Um, 
you know, our ability to share learning is so much greater than it was 30 years ago. It's our job to be able to help people to have the confidence to apply what they know and to apply it well. So I think that shift um, makes it all the more important these days to be more of a coaching style of leader than a directive um, style of leader. And I think another thing would be that um, because, again, of all the different shifts in technology, you know, we we just we're just generally <laughs> so much, I think, smarter than we were. You know, because the environment that we're all living in, never mind working in, is enabling us to be a lot smarter. You know, we're a lot quicker. Um, we we understand so much more about, you know, what it is to be human, for example, and all those human skills that we have. That we, let's be honest, just didn't so much understand um, before. I mean, you know, I, I look back sometimes, you know, hicking to um, my previous HR director career, and particularly... Um, you know, fairly early on, there are things now that when I look back, we all thought that they were the right way to do things. Like performance management would be a you know yeah. perfect one, right? You know, we took on board the GE style of um, performance management. Yeah, normal distribution curves. Yeah. You know, forcing people into certain you know ratings and this, that, and the other. Very transactional, very carrot and stick. We now know that was wrong. Yeah, we have come a long, long way in terms of our understanding of what it is to be human and, you know, how to get the best out of human beings. Um, and actually, I think that's another good point. We understand about human beings. We used to treat people as human doings previously. And you can yeah, direct no, a human doing. You can't direct a human being. Yeah, no, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's, it's people don't in leading i'm not gonna say all oh, but you see lots of businesses where the leaders don't as you read what exactly what you say you don't really treat people as human beings it's almost like you come into work and you forget all the principles that you have in terms of connecting them with having relationship with human beings because now now they're not family or friends they're just people who work for you but they're still humans and they're still motivated by the same sorts of things they still have the same aspirations same desires and yeah as you as you're saying there it's about how do, how do you get that that out of them so you can create an environment where they can thrive? And I think someone said to me very early on, I think, I think when I, I probably a, a budding manager, uh, and I was saying, and, and I think someone was saying, right, so how are you going to motivate me? Um, in, I can't remember what I said, actually, because I think I was probably quite stumped at the time. And I remember speaking to one of my mentors uh, about it, and they were saying, well, it's, your job isn't to motivate them. Your job is to create an environment in which they are motivated, but that's the, the motivation comes from within. You you can't just wave a magic wand and say, all right, you're now motivated because I do X, Y, and Z. And I think a lot of leaders believe that their job is, I've got to have some, you know, amazing uh, te technology or, or thing that can actually just, I wave a wand and all of a sudden, you're now motivated, I can move on and motivate someone else. And I've got a motivated team, as opposed yeah. to putting the hard work in, which is what you're saying, in terms of the values, the trust, um, the environment, you know, and, and what someone said to me once about, about thirst for knowledge, I say it to my kids all the time, it's actually trying to encourage people to have a thirst for knowledge so that, like Heather, they're not just ringing you up and saying, tell me what to do. Because I, I, I even do it with the kids. My, my mum used to do it with me. I used to say, mum, what does this word mean? And she'd say, go and look in the dictionary and then yeah. come and tell me. And I'll have a discussion with you about what it means. <laughs> I'm not just telling you what it means because then you just become very lazy and you're not self-sufficient. I used to, I'm just like Heather, I used to hate it at the time. And yeah. think, oh, mum, just tell me what it means. <laughs> Whereas now you think, actually, that was very smart what she did there because now I'm, I'm really engaged in trying to find out new things for myself. Yeah. So, so in terms of leadership because you've already gone through quite a few things in terms of building relationships visions uh strength based values based what 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 would you say if someone said right give me five or ten or however many key principles that you've seen in leaders or successful leaders that you think you need to have to to do it successfully what what would they be yeah well i guess we, we've mentioned i think that the one that's the first and foremost is being yourself yeah so you know we talk about authentic leadership but just say be yourself yeah don't try and be somebody else 
there was a guy um, who was on a group workshop that I was running on peak performance last week, and uh, and I won't mention his name, <laughs> but uh, we he introduced himself as part of the um, introductions, would you believe? And uh, he was saying that he was it was this. Uh, his dad had a small business and he was going to be at some point um, stepping into his dad's shoes. He used that phrase. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at that for a minute. We were literally just in introductions, but I couldn't help going off onto a tangent because this whole idea of stepping into somebody else's shoes. Look, you know, me and my other half at the weekend, we were walking around London and, he, and at one point uh, um, I was in high heels going out for dinner. And uh, I was saying to him, will you slow down? Will you slow down? One day you need to walk a mile in heels and you will realise how darn painful it is. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about empathising. <laughs> um, this guy was saying, you know, basically do it like his dad was doing it sort of thing. And it's like, no, you do the role the way, you know, you want to do the role, showing up as your best version of you. So being authentic isn't about, you know, showing up and, and, you know, kind of like there's authenticity with laziness. Yeah. And there's authenticity with skill. Right. And it's the authenticity with the skill. So it's bringing your best self. You know, it's it's allowing yourself to be um, vulnerable. So, um, you know, not being there as the leader believing that you have to know it all you have to have all of the right answers and that you've you know always got to appear strong you know part of the authenticity is also not just showing up as yourself but showing up as a human being so you know okay you don't want um to uh, appear completely insecure and actually you don't if you are completely insecure you're not going to be able to lead um but being able to demonstrate some of your insecurities as a human being from time to time is actually really helpful. A, because people then like you because they realize you're more like them. And that's a normal human trait to have. So it makes you much more approachable, develop some of the psychological safety as well. But it also means that you're going to get help and you're going to get support. You know, again, key thing, people want to help people out. It's a, we just can't help ourselves, can we? So part of that authenticity is also showing up in a way where people want to help you as the leader. Yeah. <laughs> and they want to fill out that 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 um that vision with colour with you, not for you, but with you. Um so I think there's a few different aspects of that authenticity. Um I think another thing would be around um having fun. Now I wouldn't have said this when I was in my old role. I did not realize of my old career. I did not realize the importance of having fun. Having fun is so important for a number of different reasons. We talk about innovation and we talk about creativity. So if we just look at that angle on things, if you're going to be um, innovative, if you're going to be creative, you have to be able to let go, loosen off a little bit, you know, You've got to be able to um, take some risks and so on. A lot of that is about having fun. Albert Einstein, I love this quote, whether or not he actually said it is another matter, but <laughs> um, he's quoted to have said that, you know, creativity is intelligence having fun. I love that. So it's no good being like super intelligent and really serious about things. Um, you're not going to get those kind of like wacky ideas coming in, which you might not, you might not go with the wacky idea. But the wacky idea is the thing that might inspire a really practical um, idea that's really going to make a difference. So, you know, let loose a little bit, have a little bit of fun, uh, allow wackiness, allow a little bit of creativity. Um, the other thing about having fun, of course, is it's hugely um, significant in terms of helping relationships bond. You think about it. You know, some of your strongest relationships will be the relationships where you have a laugh with those people as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole thing back in the like 80s and 90s when we used to go to the pub a lot after work <laughs> and have the big nights out till four o'clock in the morning. You know, so it was like a lot of it was unfortunately alcohol fueled. 
<laughs> which I wouldn't necessarily advocate these days from a high performance perspective. But, but you know, team bonding, you know, we, we tend to do things for fun. Why do, why do you go off somewhere to do team bonding, to have fun, right? And then spend another month or two working with each other in a way that's not fun. Yeah, it makes sense, does it? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll often with clients, when I'm coaching clients, you know, we, we have a laugh. We actually have a laugh as well. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to think I've got a decent sense of humour. Um, we have a laugh. We, I use an expression quite often about let's hold things loosely. It's yeah. just like, just hold things loosely or lightly. Let's have a play with things. Yeah. So we might, I might give them some homework. I might say, play with this for the next month. Yeah. And they're more likely to do something if I say play with it, then, you know, it's kind of like a strict regime around something. Yeah. Um, so I think that whole idea of playing, having fun kind of leads on to, not a tight list this is it's more of like a a wave um (laughs) this but but then it leads on to things like um explore you know so take risks you know good leaders i think are prepared to take risks you're not going to get anywhere significantly different you know again going from here to here you're not going to get somewhere significantly different if you're not prepared to take some risks and get from here to here at pace as well if you're not prepared to take some risks um, so yeah, having sort of explorer's mindset, try things, take risks, be prepared to fail. You know, I love this idea of, you know, failing is first attempt in learning. Um, so I think that they would be some of the things, I don't know whether or not it was a, a list so much, but I think those things are all really important and no, they're important in coaching and leadership. Yeah. I, I think, I think they're, they're really useful because, because. You're only, you're only stage three, but uh, you, you could break those down into like 200, each yeah. single one of them. It's really, I, I, in fact, my last po- podcast was on uh, failure uh, and how people, even the term failure, as you just said there, it's, it's your first attempt in, in success, isn't it? It's your, it's your stepwise. And I think you, good leaders understand that actually failure isn't really failure. And actually, I found it's very interesting in the UK because then when you go to the US, People wear the fact they've been bankrupt three times on like the sh- on on the lapel, like oh well, look, yeah, you've never got anywhere so you've been, you know, you've had a chapter whatever it is, <laughs> however many times. Whereas in England, it's like, oh yeah, I, I ran this business and it failed. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you ran the business, didn't you? And you started the business and you attempted it. And yeah, the only failure to me is if you haven't learned from it. If you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, now that is definitely failure. But if you're yeah. learning each time and then you're improving and moving on. Then to my mind, that's that is how you learn things. It's like you know, a baby, you know, when they start walking, they fall over millions of times. Now we don't, we don't say, "Oh, you failed, haven't you? You fall yeah. over. You fall, don't bother doing it again. You just keep going until you know yeah. how to do it." Um, well, well, we do when the babies, but unfortunately, as they get a bit older, well, again, we start that conditioning starts where yeah. we we bring in the concept of failure to kids really early on if we're not careful. There was one other thing I wanted to add in, actually, and it's about strategic patience and the exponential curve. Oh, I like that. Go on. That is so important in terms of leadership. And again, I think a lot of leaders um, are too afraid to accept that life and business is full of exponential curves. (laughs) So it's all about leaders and making a difference. So in a leadership role, you are not... If all you're focused on is the day in, the day out, the business as usual, you stay here. You are not making a difference. It's status quo. That's management. Leaders make a difference. So they're determining this place over here where they want to get to, which obviously keeps shifting, but this place they want to get to, and they're working with people, and those people are collectively then getting to this place over here. That's a difference or a change. I prefer these days making a difference rather than making a change. Change starts to feel, you know, humans don't like change. Yeah. We actually do like different. It's weird. But anyway, it seems to work. So we're trying to get them to, 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 to do that. So in this making this difference, um, I've lost my train of thought now. Ah, <laughs> in this making a difference, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to, to come with us and To begin with, what tends to happen is the things that we are doing will quite often mean that 
there'll be a dip maybe in performance because we're changing things in order to get here. So we'll have a dip in performance. We've got to have the strategic patience to be able to keep doing the things, yeah, changing the things that will ultimately take us up in our performance and get us to here, the exponential curve. What and, uh, happens? So, Carol. Oh, so I was going to say, so what happens is when people are in the dip, and I wish I could remember whose book it was because there's a book about being in the dip, um, but when people are in the dip, all too often what they do is they panic, the leader panics, and they stop making all of those changes. So the dip is really shallow, and then the upward trajectory then is either flat or it's upward, but it's not going up very far. In other words, they don't really get where they're actually wanting to go to. So there's a term which I read in Dory Clark's book, The Long Game, um, strategic patience. And I love this idea. I think as individuals, we need to have strategic patience with ourselves when we're taking on new habits. I do a lot of work with clients around taking on new habits, that's part of their changes. But from an organizational perspective, when we're leading, we're trying to take on board new processes, new technology, new policies, new whatever. It's the change bit. And we give up too early because of the dip and the pressure that we feel for the short term results. So you've got to be prepared to have strategic patience, go through your exponential curves and have the confidence that um, you might be getting a bit of a beating maybe sometimes when you're in the dip, but have the confidence to lead and take people where you want to really take them. And I think that that, that actually possibly, in my humble opinion, might be what separates some of the really great leaders from the good leaders potentially. Because if you're in that dip and you're not working for yourself, even if you work for yourself, you're probably going to change. You think, oh my God, it's not going as quick as I thought. I'm going to change and start doing okay. different things. But when you're definitely when you're working for a corporate or whatever, it takes quite strong leaders to be able to say, hang on, no, this is going to, th- what I'm doing is the right things to do. And you're going to get, you will see that upturn soon, but you have to stick with me. And lots of people, as you just said there, will panic and think, all right, no, I know that's the right thing to do, but I'm going to change it all because my boss keeps saying, where's the sales? Where's the sales? Where's the sales? And I, I can't bear another meeting. Whereas actually, if you've done all the things you've talked about and you've thought about the vision and you've thought about the strategy and all those sorts of things, you know you're doing the right things. And that, I really like that. I've not heard that term before, strategic patience. And I think that's a really, really important. Because I, I mean, I, I've worked with people before and I've seen it where, you know, a boss is saying, mm, should we slash the price? Should we do this? Should mm-hmm. we do that? And then people mm-hmm. say, no, because all the things I'm doing are going to come to fruition and then it does come to fruition and the boss then thinks, oh, thank God I didn't, you know, slash yeah. the price. Uh, yeah. and, and it is, you want to employ and you want to get other leaders in the business who can be strong uh, yeah. and that's how you get stronger businesses, isn't it? So um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I re- I've, I've never heard that before, strategic patience, but I love it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be nicking that and I'll be using that all over the place. Oh, you, you do that. You're, you're very welcome. Like I say, I nicked it as well. But I use it all, all the time with my clients now, whether I'm talking about stuff with them where we're working together on things. And I'll say to them, you know what, these next few months might feel really rough. You know, I know you've come to me to be able to, because most of the time people are coming, not all the time, but most of the time they're coming because it's like, um, it's not that there's a problem with their performance necessarily, but they need to up their performance to deal with the increasingly challenging demands um, that both their role and life outside of their job combined is is creating. So, you know, and again, that that's the reality is, you know, the roles at the top of these organisations are getting more and more challenging. Um, and then life, life is getting more and more challenging. You put the two things um, together, the the what you bring to it as a leader from a performer's perspective has got to be more than it was before. Otherwise, you are either going to be stuck, got, get left behind, or burn out and break. Yeah. <laughs> so Very you true. have to keep finding new ways um, to operate on a personal level in terms of your own self-leadership as well, which is a particular um, 
if you like, um, focus of my coaching, um, you know, you've got to be keep pulling more things out of the bag, you know, improving your habits, your routines, your personal performance basics, your understanding about the human being and how you are one. And so how do you optimize your own human performance? Everyone else that you are either working with, working for, working alongside, leading, um, partnering maybe from another organization. They're all human beings as well. The more you can understand about the human being, and particularly about the the brain, uh, which is why I've been studying everything I can about neuroscience over the last five years, the more you can understand that in a leadership role, then the more likely you are going to be able to not just survive, but thrive through the challenging times, which are never going to go back over and become less challenging, let's be honest. No, sadly not. And, and, and actually, I can't, I can't, I've just looked at the time, I can't believe how the time disappeared. For, uh, <laughs> we've already been going for about 55 minutes. So I wanna, I'm going to have to ask you a few final questions. Oh. And I, I say this occasionally to people, but not all the time. I'm going to have to get you back on because I've got about 100 more questions to ask you that I've just not, <laughs> I've just not got to because got to, your, your answers have been so engaging that, you know, that I know that people will be getting loads of value from it. So in terms of your book, Firstly, what's it about super neuro, neuro you, sorry? Um, and, you know, where do people get it? Well, okay, Amazon, thanks. obviously, because it's an Amazon bestseller, so that's obvious. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, go on to Amazon. You can't, it, I know some people don't like Amazon, so you can get it from Waterstones online as well. Um, but the book, um, it's written as a story, and I've deliberately um, written a very easy read for people to be able to read about a character called Laura, who ha- there is a catalyst in her life at the beginning of the story that leads her to engage with a coach, moi. And so you get to find out um, all about Laura's coaching journey over a period of time and all the various different things that I do with, with Laura in session and the homework that she does between the sessions and then how that enables her to be a more effective leader and a more effective human being. So her life improves at the same time. Um, and you kind of see her three years on at the end. So it's got a nice beginning, middle and end. It's an easy read. It's got a bit of tragedy. It's got a, um, a, a few laughs in it. Um, it's got lots of things that you can learn um, alongside Laura. So I've deliberately given the character coaching challenges that are quite common for a lot of my clients. Um, but set in a, um, it's more about the person than it is about her leadership role. Because, you know, the bottom line is sometimes, came. I think we forget that whether we're leaders or we're, you know, the employees of leaders or the boss of leaders, uh, we're just all people, you know, showing up every day you know, putting our knickers on and trying to do the best job possible. And yep. so I've, I've written it very kind of like that, you know, you get to see Laura in all sorts of different situations in her life. She's a real human being, um, just like the rest of us. She goes through some stuff. She learns some stuff through coaching with me. And as you read the story, you can do the exercises that she does in the coaching sessions and you can do the homework as well. And I like, yeah, so it's, a, it's a very innovative way of, so what, what made you come up with that style? Because I'm not, I don't think I've read many books which are like that in terms of they're teaching you, but they're giving you a story to hang the whole thing yeah. on to make it more engaging. So what, 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 how did you come up with that idea? Because most of my clients will say to me, um, I haven't got time to read, Claire. I, I haven't got time to read. So they're not going to read. So I, I will recommend books galore. And they'll say, I haven't got time to read. In fact, one of my clients, um, a guy called Gareth, you know, he um, has said to me several times, look, I haven't got time to read. I expect you to do the reading. And then you just give me the learnings that come out of the book. <laughs> now, I'm oh sort God. of exaggerating because actually he has read a lot of the books that I've recommended alongside that. But he did once tell me that. Um, now, and this is the thing. You know, pe- pe- people are too busy to be reading, mm-hmm. even though I, I really wish they were reading anywhere. So therefore, I thought, well, I need to write a book that people might take on holiday and read it for the story. But they'd go, oh, my God, I'm actually learning stuff almost by osmosis whilst reading it or be sufficiently then motivated themselves 
to choose to do some of the exercises um, that go with the book. All right. No, yeah, and I think that makes perfect sense. And <laughs> one of the ways I get around, I love reading actually, but we're, we're all busy. So I, I've actually started listening to lots of audio books because I do a lot of cycling. So especially business books, I, I, I digest quite a lot in there. But the only problem is that you start thinking, I want to write that down. And then by the yeah. time you've got back, you've lost you've lost your place on the business, <laughs> on the audio thing. You're thinking, oh, where, where was that bit that I wanted? So, uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes, but it, it does allow you to digest a lot more than if I was just reading, reading, reading uh, yeah. all the time. So I, I do a mixture of two. So we've come to the end of the hour. So before I go, I always ask if there's one thing. So I, always, I don't know why I ever say this, because people always listen to it and give me loads of good feedback on the guests and all the things that they've learned. But if, the, if, the, if someone listens to it and doesn't listen to anything else, what's one thing that you'd say, right, make sure that you do this or remember this? Be yourself. Yeah. I think that is a perfect uh, point on on where to end. I think, I, think, I think that's good advice for virtually every situation you can ever find, but certainly as a leader. Um, because I, think, I can't remember who was, who was on LinkedIn who said that their mother used to say, be yourself because everyone else is taken. Um, Love it. I think, I think that. So, I, so thank you very much for the very engaging hour, Claire. I will definitely be tapping you up to come back on because I think that we've only just scratched the surface, but I think it was a good scratching of the surface and I really yeah. appreciate you spending this time on the Hands On Business podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Loved it, Hakeem. So thanks for Sharon Benson for, for recommending we got in touch. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Well, that's another one where I really don't know where the time went. Now, great content from Claire, I'm sure you'll agree, and much more than I was anticipating, so I didn't even ask half the questions that I intended. Therefore, I need to get Claire back on for round two, and I'm sure everyone will enjoy that. So what I really like about all my guests actually on the podcast, and Claire really exemplified this, is the way they make everything simple and clear. From the examples Claire gave to the key principles of leadership, especially the strategic patient, it's all stuff that you can take on board and start doing immediately. And as Claire said right at the end, if there's one thing to remember in leadership and coaching, authenticity, I think they call it these days, but in Claire's terms, just be yourself. Details on how to get hold of Claire are in the podcast description. And don't forget to check out the show notes at www.thesalesaccelerationformula.com. And as always, subscribe, like, and share with your friends, colleagues, and anyone else who you think may be interested. But most of all, keep the feedback coming so that we can continue to improve and give you more of what you like. Hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And as I always do, keep listening and keep growing.